All right, for our Sunday night message, we're going to be uh, we're going to start off in Genesis chapter thirty-two. Genesis chapter thirty-two, and uh, we I'm going to give you a heads up now where we're going to be uh, in quite a few different passages, but uh, we're going to start off in Genesis chapter thirty-two. Um, we're continuing our, our study here in Genesis. We just wrapped up Genesis 31 uh, last uh, Sunday night. And we're going to read these first two verses here in Genesis 32. And I was honestly thinking about just skipping over them kind of uh, and just going on. But I want to draw attention to what's going on in verses 1 and 2 because you can honestly read them and not get the significance of what's going on here. In Jacob's life and so I, I, I want to take this Sunday night and focus in on these two verses and it'll really tie in I believe well with the uh, Sunday school lesson that I just brought uh, the, in fact the past two Sunday school lessons that I just brought from first Samuel and so the title of the message tonight I'll give you that now is uh, Mahanaim I'm sure I'm probably not saying that correctly but it's the last word of verse 2 Mahanaim. Let's uh, read verse 1 and 2 now. It says, And Jacob went on his way, and the angels of God met him. And when Jacob saw them, he said, This is God's host. And he called the name of that place Mahanaim. Lord, I just want to ask you to take over our time together, Lord. I, I thank you so much for the privilege of uh, preaching and teaching your word uh, uh, tonight, Lord. And, and I just ask you to please bless uh, our time together. Lord, please speak to each and every one of us through your word. I ask you to empty me of self and fill me with your Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray that this message would be very clear tonight. I hope this message would be an encouragement to folks. And Lord, I just, I, again, I thank you so much for your word. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. <clears throat> now... Jacob has gone on his way here. If you remember in chapter 31, he is now done uh, in his dealings with his uncle Laban. He has left Laban for the last time. And so all of that, the past 20 years of his life, is put behind him. He's dealt with that, and God has dealt with that. And now he's going forward, and, and he's, he's getting ready to meet Esau again. And if you remember correctly, Esau wants to kill Jacob. We're told that in verse 1 that Jacob went on his way. And notice this. A lot of times we can read this and not even, not even catch it. But it says, And the angels of God met him. That's it. <laughs> I mean, we're given verse 2 on this also. And we'll, we'll get into that in just a second. But I want you to let that sink in. Angels met him. I don't know about you, but this is not your normal day. Okay? This, is not, uh, this is not your everyday thing. Angels of God met him. Let that sink in. And it's not just one angel. It's multiple. It says angels of God. There's at least two. And there's probably quite a few more than that because he says in verse 2, this is God's host. Host being his army, his angelic army. This would be a number of angels. This would be a lot of them. We're talking hundreds, thousands, dare I say even possibly millions. I really don't know. But it's a lot of them. And when Jacob saw them, it says in verse 2, I mean, get your head wrapped around them. He's not only imagining they're there, he's not even, yes, God's angel is with us. He sees them. <laughs> he literally sees these guys. And when Jacob saw them, he said, This is God's host. This is God's armed forces. And he called the name of that place Mahanaim. Mahanaim means, uh, I've seen a couple of different meanings for it, but it, it, it has the idea of two. And so it's either two camps or two hosts. Okay, two military camps. It's not, you know, whatever. It's two groups of people is the meaning of the word Mahanaim, two 
groups of people. The subtitle of the message tonight, I'm, I'm going to say is, we're not outnumbered anymore. Not outnumbered anymore. Jacob sees that there are two camps of people, two hosts of people. He can see he, he and his uh, wives and, and children, and he can see his servants and all the people that, that are serving under him and all the people that are working under him. He can also see the, the camp of the angels. He can see the group of angels off, off to, the, to the side there. This is amazing. God is showing Jacob, hey, look, you're not alone. In fact, I mean, this is amazing because I think God is showing him two things. I really do believe there's two uh, things that God is showing him at this pivotal point in Jacob's life. I think he's showing him about, the, about chapter 31. Listen, my angels were with you the whole time that Laban was dealing with you. And we went into the fact that really Laban was a very dangerous man. And there was a serious threat here to, to Jacob's life with his uncle Laban. And so we saw that. And, and so I believe God is trying to show him, hey, look, I had it the whole time. My angels, my, my, uh, my, so, my spiritual soldiers were with you all along. It, you were never in any real danger. I had you the whole time. I believe he's shown him that. I also believe he's shown him, now that should also affect your future. I want to show you that, that uh, hey, Jacob, I, I, I had you in the past. I've protected you in the past. I'm going to protect you in the future. You're about to meet your brother Esau. And I want you to know that I am with you and my soldiers, my angelic host, is with you. You know, in previous lessons, we've, we've uh, in previous Sunday school lessons, the last two, we've seen that humanly speaking, we are outnumbered. We are outnumbered. Uh, in 1 Samuel chapter 13, Saul had 600 men. The Philistines were innumerable. Couldn't even count them. That would be a vastly outnumbered situation. We discovered in the last message that we can either ignore this problem, we can try to win with our meager power, or we can call on God. And we can fight the battles of life with God's help. Jacob is an example. I want to present him to you tonight as an example of a man who, is called, who has called on God and placed his faith and trust in Jesus Christ in order to have victory over the world, the flesh, the devil, and even death. I hope you've done that too. I want to... I'm going to assume you have. Now, whether you have or not, that's between you and God. So, uh, I would encourage you to get that settled. But Jacob is an example of a man who has called on God and is trusting God in his life and with his battles. Jacob is about to show us that for the child of God, you're not outnumbered anymore. You're not outnumbered anymore. See, when... When we're born into this life, to quote David, uh, man is uh, but a few days and full of trouble. When you're born in this life, you've got a wicked flesh that wants to get you in trouble. You've got a world system that is against you. You've got the devil and his demons aiming for you. And at the end of that, all of that, you're facing death. You are surrounded by enemies. We are just overpowered. But I want you, and we are outnumbered. Uh, it says the Philistines were innumerable. You could, they were as the sand of the seashore. We don't even know how many there were of them. There were so many. And all Saul had was 600. You are so outnumbered. But when you're with the Lord and when you are serving, when you are a child of God and you're in the will of God and walking with the Lord, I want you to understand, you are not outnumbered anymore. When you have, when you have entered the family of God, when you have received Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you now have heaven on your side. You are no longer outnumbered. It says that Jacob went on his way, and the angels of God met him, and when Jacob saw them, he said, This is God's host, and he called the name of that place Mahanaim. You are not outnumbered anymore if you're the child of God. I want you to 
Hold your place here in Genesis chapter 32 and turn over to Psalm 34. Psalm 34. Uh, people ask all the time, you know, do we have guardian angels? Well, for the child of God, the answer is absolutely yes. Yes, we do. In Psalm number 34, look, at, look, look with me, if you will, in verse number 6. Listen to the psalmist here. He said, This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him. Now, what, what did I encourage you to do in the last sermon? I encourage you to cry out to God. I, I encourage you to call out to the Lord. It says that the, the psalmist in Psalm 34, David said, Hey, look, I've cried out to God before, and the Lord heard me and saved me out of all my troubles. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. Verse, six, verse 7. The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him and delivereth them. Hey, the, the Lord has sent a guardian angel for the child of God, and this, this angel will deliver them. It, he encamps round about them. You remember the meaning of the word Mahanim? Two camps. Yeah. The angel of the Lord is camping around the child of God. He's protecting the child of God. Uh, turn to Psalm 91. Psalm 91. Let's look at this. Another passage of Scripture here. Psalm 91 and verse number 9. The psalmist says, Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge even the Most High, thy habitation. In other words, he says, because you've made God your habitation, because you've accepted Jesus Christ, it, because you have, you have accepted God and you are beginning a walk with the Lord and you, you are serving the Lord, you've made Him your habitation. Because of that, there shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. For he, listen to this, for he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. He shall give his angels charge over you. The child of God who is walking with the Lord, who is seriously seeking the Lord. Uh, and, and let me just stop there and say this. Listen, a person that's saved and just starting out uh, on their journey with the Lord, the Lord is going to be with them and protect them. He's going to send His angels to protect them. He's going to be with them. He's going to be walking with them. Now, if, if you, as the child of God, decide that you want to stray from Him and start doing your own thing, do not expect these protections. I do believe in what the Bible, uh, uh, I believe the Bible teaches uh, what we call eternal security. I do believe that when a person is saved, they're always saved. I believe that when a person's soul is saved, it's always when a person has been forgiven of their sins, I believe they're always forgiven of their sins. Now, if a person, if a child of God decides to willingly uh, sin against God, I believe that they leave the protections of God. They leave a lot of the blessings of God. Let me give you an example. The prodigal son in the Bible never stopped being a son. He never ceased being a son. Now, did he leave the protections and blessings of his father? Yes, he did. But he never stopped being his father's son. That never ceased. I believe the Bible teaches that once you're a child of God, you're always a child of God. See, once Jacob was a child of God, no matter how wicked he was, he was always a child of God. Uh, a perfect example in the Bible, Lot is a child of God. We're not even given the passage where he became a child of God. But we're told in the New Testament, that man was righteous, period. There's no question about it. It says that Lot had a righteous soul. In other words, he was saved. He was forgiven of his sins. And so, now did Lot decide to leave the, leave the protections and blessings of God? Yes, he did. And even still, God still had a protective hand upon him. He said, hey, look, I can't judge the city until I get you out of it. So even then, God had his protective hand on Lot. But did Lot lose a lot of his blessings? Yes, he did. Did Lot lose his soul? No, he did not. So understand, the Bible teaches, for the child of God, you're not going to lose your soul if you stray from him, but you may lose some of these protections and blessings. But listen to this. For the child of God that is walking with the Lord, 
He's, he says in verse, verse uh, 11, For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. Thou shalt tread upon the lion and adder, the young lion and the dragon shalt thou trample under feet. Because he hath set his love upon, upon me, therefore will I deliver him. This is what, now, this segues into what God's speaking of the, of the child of God. God says, because the child of God hath set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high, because he hath known my name. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. Well, we have the promises of God right here. If you will set your love on God, it says here, he will honor you and deliver you. He will be with you in time of trouble. He says in verse 16, with long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. But go back with me, if you will, to verse 11. He shall give his angels charge over thee. I'm telling you, the child of God... And more specifically, the child of God that is walking with the Lord and seeking Him, and seeking to have a right walk with Him, uh, He is a guardian angel. In fact, it says angels. That's plural. I believe you've got more than one angel. I believe when Jacob looked up and saw, he saw a bunch of angels, not just one. I believe, see, as you're walking with God, you're walking with His protections. You're walking with His angelic host. As you are walking with the Lord, you are entering, you are keeping yourself under the umbrella of His protection. See, a lot, of, a lot of Christians want to go, well, I'm saved, I'm forgiven of my sins, why should I walk with the Lord? Are you kidding? You want to miss out on these protections? I mean, you must be crazy. You must be out of your mind. Do you really want to leave the umbrella of God's protections? Do you really want to, to leave your guardian angels? I mean, really, you're, you're playing with fire. If you think you can do that and get away with it. Oh, anybody can sin, but not but no one can sin and get away with it. I tell you what, let's look at another passage. Look at Daniel chapter number 6. Daniel chapter number 6. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, and Daniel. Daniel chapter number 6. Verse number 22. Very familiar portion of Scripture. Uh, this is where uh, the king is hollering down. He, he got Daniel. He, he threw Daniel. Uh, king Darius threw Daniel into the lion's den. And, and uh, the lions didn't eat Daniel. And we're told in, in Daniel chapter 6 verse 22, Daniel tells the king what happened. He says, My God hath sent his angel and hath shut the lion's mouths that they have not hurt me. Uh, listen. Daniel, I guarantee you, was pretty thankful for his guardian angel. Pretty thankful for him. Uh, we're told over in Daniel chapter 10, listen to this, the last verse of Daniel chapter 10, uh, this is, this is a, a, an angel talking to Daniel here. He says in, in verse number 21, Daniel chapter 10 and verse number 21, the angel tells, tells Daniel, But I will show thee that which is noted in the scripture of truth, and there is none that holdeth me, uh, holdeth with me in these things, but Michael, your prince. And he names the archangel Michael there, and he calls him your prince. I believe he's talking about Israel's prince. Uh, but and, and that word prince has the, the idea of, of principality. It has the idea of, of being in power. The spiritual powers... Behind the scenes, he's telling he's telling Daniel, "Hey, listen, Michael is your prince. Your that's personal pronoun, and I, I do believe he's talking about the nation of Israel as a whole. But man, even the nation the nation of Israel has a guardian angel. Do you realize that's why Israel has never been able to be wiped out? No one is ever going to be able to wipe out Israel. They can't. They have a guardian angel. In fact, they have guardian angels." God is not going to allow that. Oh, try as they may. They've been trying forever to wipe out Israel. I mean, I want to say for the past 2,000 years, but it's longer than that. I mean, just in the last 100, and, 100 years, when we look at the Holocaust, they tried to wipe out Israel. 
It didn't happen. It just made them stronger. Every time people have tried to wipe out Israel, Babylon tried to wipe out Israel, it just made them stronger. Every time that this has happened, it just makes Israel stronger. You, they have a guardian angel. Uh, uh, turn over to Matthew chapter number 18. Matthew chapter number 18 and verse number 10. Matthew 18 and verse number 10. Jesus says this, Take heed that you despise not one of these little ones. I believe talking about saved people here. For I say unto you that in heaven their angels, see that's personal, their angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. Uh, their angels, that's plural. Uh, uh, that's, I'm sorry, that's, that's possessive and plural. Uh, now that's, that's pretty impressive right there. Uh, that's, uh, I mean, the Bible is clearly stating that we have guardian angels. Uh, we are also told in the book of Acts, we're not going to turn there. Uh, go ahead and turn over to Hebrews, but while you're turning to Hebrews, in the book of Acts we're told that Peter was set free by what? An angel. Apparently Peter had a guardian angel. In Hebrews chapter number 1, listen to this description of angels. Listen to, listen to what Hebrews has to say about angels. Now, beginning with verse number 1, uh, we're going to read uh, quite a bit of this chapter. I just want you to understand... The Bible is it, the Bible is not scared of talking about angels. It gives us a lot of details about angels, in fact. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse number 1, listen to this. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners, spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these... Okay, so God hath in these last days, verse 2, hath in these last days spoken to, unto us by his Son, God has spoken unto us by His Son, whom He hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also He made the worlds. Okay, so now this is clearly talking about Jesus Christ. Go down to verse 4. Jesus Christ being made so much better than angels. Jesus Christ being made so much better than the angels, as He hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. So we're told that Jesus Christ is better than angels. In fact, that's the main gist of this chapter. But we're told in verse number 5, For unto which of the angels, the, the writer of Hebrews asks the question, Unto which of the angels uh, said God at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee? And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to, my, to me a son. What angels has God said that to so he's clearly talking, he's clearly comparing and contrasting Jesus with angels here. And that's the purpose of this passage. Skip down to verse number 13 and look at this. But to which of the angels said God at any time, sit on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool? So again, he's continuing asking these questions. Verse 14. Are they angels? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation. What a verse about angels. Verse 14. Catch what the truth that God is giving us there in verse 14. He says, angels are ministering spirits. Ministering spirits means they minister to us. A minute, the word minister means servant. Now, I'm not saying we get to command, hey, bring me a Dr. Pepper. Hey, angel, hey, guardian angel, bring me a coat. We don't get to do that. I'm not saying that. But they are sent here to serve us, so to speak. It's, it's not that they serve our whims, but they serve God by taking care of us, by ministering to us. They are ministering spirits sent forth. They have been sent to minister, to, to serve them who shall be heirs of salvation. People who are saved. Children of God have guardian angels. It's so clear. It's, it, it tells us what their purpose is. They have been sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation. What a verse concerning guardian angels. One last passage I want you to look at, and it's back in the Old Testament. 2 Kings chapter number 6. 
2 Kings chapter number 7, one of my favorite chapters in the whole Bible. I love this chapter. It's an exciting chapter. 2 Kings chapter number 6. And I want to read a little bit here to, to get to the verse, so I want you to understand what's going on. Elisha, the prophet Elisha, is just awesome. He is just cool. He is just, I mean, a superhero. I'm just using that word flippantly, but he is... The Lord uses him in a, in a mighty way. Let's put it that way. The Lord uses him in a mighty way. It says in 2 Kings chapter number 6 and verse number 8, Then the king of Syria... Now, i got news for you. That's a bad guy in the Bible. Okay, Just put a little input there. The king of Syria warred against Israel and took counsel with his servants, saying, In such and such a place shall be my camp. In other words, he's, make, he's making war plans. He's, he's developing a strategy. He's telling his men, here's where we're going to go. And the man of God, Elisha, sent unto the king of Israel, saying, Beware that thou pass not such a place, for thither the Syrians are come down. And the king of Israel sent to the place which the man of God told him and warned him of, and saved himself there, not once nor twice. This was happening more, multiple times. This was happening a lot. In other words, the king of Syria would have a battle plan, and Elisha would know about it and warn the king of Israel. In verse 11, Therefore the heart of the king of Syria was sore troubled for this thing. I mean, if that was happening to you, what would you think? You would think somebody's spying on you. You would think you've got a leak. Uh, I think President Trump's having to be, <laughs> been having to deal with a lot of leaks in his White House. But therefore the heart of the king of Syria was sore troubled for this thing. And he called his servants and said unto them, Will ye not show me uh, which of us is for the king of Israel? Hey, which of us is the spy? Hey, whoever's spying, rat him out right now. Here's your chance. And one of his servants said, None, my lord, O king, but Elisha the prophet that is in Israel telleth the king of Israel the words that thou speakest in thy bedchamber. The prophet Elisha knows what you're saying in private. The Elisha, it, God Almighty, is omnipotent. He's everywhere. And he's telling Elisha exactly what you're doing and what you're saying. He's telling Elisha what you're thinking, king. Verse 13. And the king said, go and spy where he is. Go find out where this Elisha is. Now, if somebody's powerful enough to know the words that you're saying in your bed, don't you think that finding out where they're at is just silly. Why would you even want to know where they're at? <laughs> I mean, don't you think they're going to know that you know where they're at? I mean, but he says, Go and spy where he is, that I may send and fetch him. And it was told him, saying, Behold, he is in Dothan. Therefore, the king sent thither horses and chariots and a great host. There's that word again. I remember Jacob saw the angel and says, that's, that's God's host. Uh, he saw a great host, and they came by night and compassed the city about. They surrounded the city where Elisha was. And when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, an host compassed the city, both with horses and chariots. This man's name is Gehazi. When Gehazi, uh, it's, it's Elisha's servant, when Gehazi goes out and he sees, Whoa, we're surrounded! We're in trouble! The, the city is surrounded with horses and chariots. And Gehazi said unto Elisha, Alas, my master, how shall we do? What are we going to do? And Elisha answered, verse 16, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. What a statement. They that are with us. He's saying... We're not outnumbered anymore. You don't have to worry, Gehazi. We're not outnumbered. Uh, we outnumber them. It says in verse 17, And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha, the Lord's host. Apparently, I mean, think of how many years are between Jacob and Elisha. 
I mean, a couple thousand years, 1,500 years, I'm just shooting from the hip there. Hundreds of years between Jacob and Elisha, and the Lord is still doing what he does. He's still working the same way. There's still a Mahanaim. There's still two camps. There's still the Lord's host. Dear child of God, I want you to understand you have guardian angels. Now, let me say this. Even if none of that were true, and it is, Romans 8.31 tells us this. If God be for us, who can be against us? God doesn't even need the angels. I mean, that, that's the mind-blowing thing to really study about the angels. God doesn't need them. There's nothing in the Bible that tells us that God needs guardian angels. There's nothing in the Bible that points out that God needs angels. There's nothing in the Bible that points out that God needs us. If he did, people wouldn't go to hell. But they do. If There's nothing in the Bible that points out that God needs anybody. There is all kinds of evidence in the Bible that point out that God wants us and loves us. And we better have a realistic view of that. I find it interesting that God chooses to use angels. You know, I, I think one day when we're in heaven, I, I don't think we're just going to be sitting, sitting around goofing off doing nothing. I think God's going to use us. I think we're going to have things to do. And I think we're going to enjoy it. I think we're going to have the time of our lives working for the Lord in heaven. I think we're just going to enjoy ourselves all the time doing what He wants us to do. We're going to have such a sense of fulfillment in heaven. There's going to be such a sense of fulfillment working for our Lord. It's going to be wonderful. He's going to have things for us to do. I find it amazing that He uses angels at all. Which I find it amazing that he uses human beings at all. He uses Elisha. He uses Elijah. He uses uh, he uses David. He uses uh, Samuel. That's a, he uses Jacob. Oh, it's amazing. If you're a child of God, I want you to understand: you are no longer. You are no longer. The moment that you enter into the family of God, you are now with the majority as far as angels go. <laughs> uh, we're told that I, I, I believe that only a third of the angels followed the devil. So if you want to get even literal, technical, I believe that uh, there are more uh, good angels than bad angels. Child of God, you are no longer outnumbered. You have the heavenly host on your side. You have God's host camping round about you. Mahanim. The Lord and His host are with you. The world, the flesh, and the devil, and even death itself, have no claim on the child of God anymore. How wonderful it must have been when Jacob realized he's not alone. He's not outnumbered anymore. What a wonderful realization it must have been. What a wonderful sight it must have been for Jacob to look and see those angels marching with him. Later on in that chapter, he wrestles with their commanding officer. And we'll get into that Lord willing, next week, Jacob wrestling with God. But uh, uh, for now, I want you to understand, if you're a child of God, you are not outnumbered, you are not outmatched. Oh, how wonderful when Jacob realized that. And oh, how wonderful when we realize that. Do you realize that, child of God? You are not outnumbered. God's host is with you. He has you. Even if none of that were true, if God be for us, who can be against us? Realize that. 
You realize all God has to do is speak and everything changes. Everything changes when God speaks. That's all he has to do. He speaks and all of a sudden everything's created. He speaks and the waves die down and the wind dies down. He speaks and Lazarus comes back from the dead. He defeats the enemy we call death. If you are a child of God, if you have placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, what he did on the cross for your sins, if you have asked him for forgiveness, let me tell you, you are no longer outnumbered or outmatched. Heavenly Father, just want to close tonight. Lord, I hope this has been a blessing. I hope this has been a help. Lord, we, I mean, your Bible actually teaches that we have guardian angels. What's even more amazing than that? And we don't even realize that half the time, but what's even more amazing than that is you don't even need guardian angels. Because if you're with us, then who can be against us? Lord, I pray that we would grab a hold of that truth. As the children of God, as, as people who are forgiven of their sins, as the saved, Lord, I pray that we would grab a hold of the truth that we are not outnumbered nor outmatched anymore. If we have you, Lord, if we've invited you into our heart, we have everything we need. We have defeated death. Lord, we have power to defeat our flesh. We have power to defeat our, the world system. We have power to defeat the devil. Lord, I pray that we would realize that as Christians, what power we have at our disposal. I pray that we wouldn't be scared. I pray that we wouldn't be fearful. Lord, I pray that we wouldn't fear anything, including death. I understand that it causes us pause and it causes us trouble. But Lord, I pray that we would trust you. Lord, I pray that we would realize that we are not outnumbered nor outmatched in Jesus' name.